This is Arts 107, Impressionism to Contemporary Art History, asynchronous online class in spring 2023 at Bethany Lutheran College. You're listening to adjunct professor Karis Carmichael Braun as she reads from the seventh edition of History of Modern Art by H.H. H. Arneson and Elizabeth C. Mansfield. The Search for Truth, Early Photography, Realism, and Impressionism. And now we'll jump over the pond and go from Europe into America in the 19th century art in the United States. At the opening of the 20th century, artists in both Britain and America had not yet embraced the most progressive developments in continental Europe. American artists historically lack the critical support systems of the established art academies, and therefore many of them studied abroad, and a tradition of government patronage. Despite the limitations of its art apparatus, American culture had generated major figures such as Benjamin West and John Singleton Copley in colonial times, and the late 19th century expatriates Cassatt, Whistler, and John Singer Sargent were capable of holding their own in the European art capitals. After the Civil War, Americans had proved vigorously original in architecture and through this medium had made decisive contributions to the visual arts. But that promising was start was brought to a halt by the same academic bias that had held so many painters and sculptors in thrall to outmoded aesthetics inherited from the classical and the romantic past. While the more self-assured and talented European artists grew strong through resistance to the academy, Americans generally felt the need to master tradition rather than to innovate against it. American artists were aware that to progress in their art, it would be necessary to achieve their own artistic identity, assimilating influences from the generative centers in Europe until these had been transformed by authentic native sensibility into something independent and distinctive. Whatever the developments in painting and sculpture back home, no American artist had sensed the coming of the new more presciently than the expatriates, such as Whistler and Cassatt. Similarly, immersed in the European cultural milieu was John Singer Sargent. Born to American parents living abroad, he spent most of his career in Paris and London, though he received many portrait commissions from leading American families. His flashing, liquid stroke and flattering touch in portraiture made him one of the most famous and wealthy artists of his time. Moreover, in a major work like Madame X, Sargent revealed himself almost mesmerized, like a latter day Ancre, by the abstract qualities of pure line and flat silhouette. At the same time, he so caught the explicit qualities of surface and inner character that the painting created a scandal when publicly shown at the Salon. For in addition to the figure's already decollete dress, Sargent had placed the left hand strap off her shoulder. To placate an offended public after the salon closed, he adjusted the strap as we see it today. He also kept this painting for 30 years before selling the portrait to his friend, the director of the Met Museum in New York City, with one caveat, that the work could not bear the sitter's name. The experience prom prompted the artist to leave Paris and establish his practice in London. In his most painterly works, meanwhile, Sargent carried gestural virtuosity inspired by Franz Halls and Diego Velazquez to levels of pictorial autonomy not exceeded before the advent of the abstract expressionists after World War II. Americans who chose photography as their medium of expression stood out in the international salons organized for exhibiting the new camera made art and indeed often won the major prizes and set the standards for both technical mastery and aesthetic vision. Contemporaries of Whistler, Cassatt and Sargent were the American photographers Gertrude Kaysbeer and 
Clarence Hudson White, both of whom pursued pictorialism, a style of photography that avoids the exactitude possible with photographs and instead emulates the softer lines and atmospheric quality of Impressionist painting. Pictorialism arose in the late 19th century in part as a response to critics' charges that photography was not a legitimate art form. Source, Charles Baudelaire, from his Salon of 1859. Photography came under pointed scrutiny in this review through, through though Baudelaire hailed modernity and the technological advances associated with it, he dismissed the notion of photography as art. Baudelaire believed that an artwork must be the result of the imaginative faculty. Photography, he felt, supplanted human genius with merely mechanical reportage. Poetry and progress are like two ambitious men who hate one another with an instinctive hatred. And when they meet upon the same road, one of them has to give place. If photography is allowed to supplement art in some of its functions, it will soon have supplanted or corrupted it altogether, thanks to the stupidity of the multitude, which is its natural ally. It is time then for photography to return to its true duty, which is to be the servant of the sciences and the arts, but the very humble servant, like printing or shorthand, which have neither created nor supplemented literature. Let it hasten to enrich the tourist album and restore to his eye the precision which his memory may lack. Let it adorn the naturalist library and enlarge microscopic animals. Let it even provide information to corroborate the astronomer's hypotheses. In short, let it be the secretary and the clerk of whoever needs an absolute factual exactitude in his profession. Up to that point, nothing could be better. Let it rescue from oblivion those tumbling ruins, those books, prints, and manuscripts, which time is devouring precious things whose form is dissolving and which demand a place in the archives of our memory, it will be thanked and applauded. But if it be allowed to encroach upon the domain of the impalpable and the imaginary, upon anything whose value depends solely upon the addition of something of a man's soul, then it will be so much the worse for us Like Cassatt, Kazebeer specialized in the mother and child theme, while White waved the banner for photography as its own art, even starting his own school, the first in America to teach photography as art. White aligned himself with the elite social content of Sargent's portraiture, and the Japonisme influenced aestheticism of Whistler's musical arrangements. The camera offered an unparalleled capacity to render the reality so beloved by Americans, but it could also transcend the particular details of a given subject. Using soft focus to infuse emotion and mystery into their images, Kazebeer and White tempered the precision of their photographers with an evocative lyricism characteristic of their American peers Whistler and Cassatt. More exclusively rooted in American experience than Whistler, Cassatt, and Sargent, and thus more representative of the point of departure for American art in the 20th century, were Winslow, Homer, and Thomas Aikens. Homer was an illustrator for Harper's Weekly magazine in New York for 18 years. Harper's Weekly was a type of magazine which was dominated by images rather than text. In an article by Amy Athey McDonald for Yale News, David Blight, the class of 1954 professor of American history and director of the Gilder Lehman Center for Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition says, Harper's was life magazine and television wrapped up into one. People would open their Harper's as a newspaper, but also because of the great illustrations and artwork. After working as a freelance illustrator during the early years of his career, when he was 25 years old, Homer was hired by Harper's as a full-time correspondent on the front lines with Union troops during the American Civil War, which was 1861 to 1865. 
His illustrations accompanied the magazine's reports of the conflict, and we begin to see in Homer's work a focus on real life, but not as a realist, but as a documentarian who must have known that a picture could be worth a thousand words. Homer tended to focus on the quiet moments of camp life rather than the high drama of battle. His presence at these historic killings, killing fields has been deduced primarily from the paintings and the drawings he now began to turn out with quiet intensity, creating our richest artistic record of the Civil War, said Claudia Roth Pierpoint, Pierpoint in The New Yorker. A landscape of clear-cut trees laid to waste by those vicious battles is the setting for Winslow Homer's early painting, Prisoners from the Front. At the left, three con Confederate soldiers, a disheveled youngster, an old man, and a defiant young officer, surrender to a Union officer at the right. Although Homer's painting represents a fairly unremarkable occurrence in the war, it achieves the impact of history painting in the significance of its theme. His subtle characterization of the varying classes and types of the participants in the tragic conflict alludes to the tremendous difficulties to be faced during the reconstruction period between these warring cultures. The three grays on the left are painted upright, standing with quiet dignity and defiance. All the figures are on the same level, the same ground plane, which symbolically shows each figure as equal to each other. But notice the darker skinned Union soldier's face is blurred. His legs are unfinished. It's kind of a ghost presence. A New York Times headline for an article by Ken Johnson aptly summarizes the, this multi-story time in our American history. The title is, When Painters Showed the War in More Than Blue and Gray. And you can discover a little bit more about that in the article that I posted for you in Moodle. Homer's reputation as an artist grew significantly during the Civil War thanks to the reach of Harper's Weekly. He was known throughout the United States and in London as the Illustrated London News exchanged artist work with Harper's. In 1866, Homer traveled to Paris where prisoners from the front was being exhibited. After the war, Homer came back a changed man, as many veterans do. Much of his mature work centered on the ocean now, either breezy, sun-drenched watercolors made in the Caribbean from his trips there, or dramatic views of the human struggle with the high seas off the coast of Maine, where he settled in 1884. I want to show you the Gulf Stream, which is one of his better known works as well. And the placard for this work, uh, which is on view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, just sums this up perfectly. Homer was preoccupied with the power of the ocean and often made it the subject of his art, whether at home on the coast of Maine or while traveling. The Gulf Stream is named after the strong Atlantic current that connected many of the locales where he liked to paint. Homer based this dramatic scene of imminent disaster on sketches and watercolors he had made during winter trips to the Bahamas in 1884 and 1898, after crossing the Gulf Stream several times. A man faces his demise on a dismasted, rudderless fishing boat. He can't go anywhere, and he can't direct himself, and he can't will himself anywhere. Sustained only by a few stalks of remaining sugar cane, while threatened by sharks and a distant water spout. He's oblivious to the schooner on the left horizon, which Homer later added to the composition as a sign of hopeful rescue. Painted shortly after the death of his father in 1898, the painting has been interpreted as an expression of Homer's presumed sense of mortality and vulnerability. The Gulf Stream also references some of the complex social and political issues of the era, war, the legacy of slavery, and American imperialism, as well as more universal concerns with the fragility of human life and the dominance of nature. 
in after the hurricane, an astonishingly virtuosic watercolor. The contest between the forces of nature plays itself out in an ambiguous beach scene where a seemingly lifeless man lies on the sand next to a dinghy. Both appear to have been tossed onto the shore by the roiling waves in the background. Homer's fluid handling of watercolor suggests the translucency of the foam-flecked sea and the shifting clouds. The delicacy of this medium enhances the uncertainty of a scene in which the man's condition, is he sleeping? Is he dead? Prevents easy comprehension. Or perhaps this scene might also be interpreted as a possible outcome of the dire situation depicted in the Gulf Stream. And his determination to fuse art and science for the sake of an uncompromising realism in painting, the Philadelphia painter Thomas Aikens all but revived the Renaissance tenets of Leonardo da Vinci. Not only did he dissect cadavers alongside medical students, which is a tradition of method, traditional method of artistic training, which I have done as well. And he joined Edward Moybridge in his studies of motion with stop action photography, especially those devoted to human movement. But even Aikens had an assistant pose on a cross in full sunlight as the model for a crucifixion scene. And he provided a nude male model for his female drawing students, a step that forced his resignation from the August Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Aiken's extraordinarily early painting, The Champion Single Skulls, Max Schmidt in a Single Skull, was his first treatment of an outdoor subject. In the foreground, the artist friend, a celebrated oarsman, pauses momentarily while rowing on Philadelphia's Schoolkill River, Schoolkill River, say that with me three times, Schoolkill River, and looks toward the viewer. In the middle distance, Aikens has depicted himself mid-stroke, also looking at us. A crystalline light and carefully ordered composition lead us into this rational pictorial space in which each detail is keenly observed and convincingly rendered. Aikens here has produced a realism that transcends mere illusionism by way of a magical clarity, as if time were momentarily suspended. Aikens was arguably the greatest American portraitist of the 19th century. And well, let me just stop right there. Let's let's go back to John Singer Sargent, John Singer Sargent versus Aikens. If we want to duke this out, I'll see you outside after class. But I digress. Aikens was arguably the greatest American portraitist of the 19th century, and his large painting, The Gross Clinic, is a masterpiece of this genre. The artist looked to the 17th century precedent of Rembrandt's autonomy lesson of Dr. Tulp for his heroic portrayal of a distinguished surgeon performing an operation before his class. Like Max Schmidt in his skull, Dr. Gross looks up during a break in the action. The world famous surgeon and teacher demonstrating at Jefferson Medical College's surgical amphitheater. In the midst of the dark, richly hued painting light, falls on his forehead, the intellectual powerhouse in the scene. And even more dramatically, light catches three distinct points in that narrative, the head, the hand, and the action of the surgery on the patient. But this work was somewhat shocking and controversial, a little too much gory reality without a veil of, let's say, neoclassical sterility, that the body, the blood, the snapshot of what really happened in the industry. <gasps> the Centennial Exhibition in Philly rejected showing the painting with other artworks in the Art Gallery building, but instead, this painting was displayed in a model U.S. Army Field Hospital exhibit at the Centennial Fair. But far from dispassionate in his objectivity, Aikens puts himself in the scene, sketching, recording, and participating. Uh, Aikens knew Dr. Gross because he had studied anatomy here. Also, a key participant is the seated female observer, which has been said to be a relative of the patient. 
Aikens transfers the emotional content. He conveys the human toll of modern medicine through her horrified reaction. This is similar to the weeping women in David's Oath of the Harati, and the female in the scene is placed here to serve perhaps as a foil, presumably sympathizing with us shocked viewers. Henry Osawa Tanner was an African-American artist who by the end of the 19th century had achieved significant international distinction. During the Harlem Renaissance at the beginning of the 20th century, about one generation after Osana, Osawa Tanner died in 1937 at 78 years old, he was recognized as the most important black artist of his generation. Though he studied in Philadelphia with Aikens, whose portrait style profoundly influenced his own, Tanner found a more accepting atmosphere in his adopted city of Paris. He studied at the Académie Julienne with Jean-Léon Jérôme. He exhibited widely during his lifetime, including at the Paris Salon. And he eventually befriended members of the avant-garde circle around Paul Gauguin in the rural artist communities of Brittany. The French government awarded him the prestigious Légion d'honneur. Tanner's best known work, The Banjo Lesson, was probably made during a trip back to America, um, could have been Philly and it could have been um, in the Appalachian Mountains, when he said he painted mostly Negro subjects, a genre that he felt had been stereotypically cast by white artists. With a loose weave of elongated strokes, Tanner softly defines the central pair of figures, bathing them in a light that imparts a spiritual stillness to the scene a light not unlike that used in many of his religious subjects that make up the bulk of his work. The painting rises above the stereotypical treatment of banjo playing as entertainment for a white audience. And instead, Osawa Tanner focuses on familial intimacy and imbues the figures with a dignity and gravitas not attributed to black people by the privileged power holders at the time. And I wanted to show you a couple more of Henry Osawa Tanner's uh, religious images. These are outstanding. They uh, almost vibrate. I've seen a couple of them in color in real life. They almost vibrate and are so profoundly quiet and introverted. They're, they're just magnificent. Albert Pinkham Ryder after his application was rejected, studied at the National Academy of Design in New York and also in France, where he focused his interest on the Barbizon School. He was a founding member of the Society of American Artists, a group of guys whose work did not conform to the academic standards of the day. Members included Augusta Saint, uh, Saint Gaudens, Robert Swain Gifford, writer's friend Julian Alden Weir, John Lafarge and Alexander Hel Helwig Wyant. And we're not going to go through um, those guys, but I will say that there is a residency in Connecticut where a friend of mine has go gone called Weir Farm, W E I R. Um, it's beautiful. And that John Lafarge guy, I, she's, his granddaughter or great granddaughter is a colleague of mine from the New York Academy of Art. Her name is Jane. Lafarge Hamill, and she is fantastic. She's a fantastic painter, and she lives in New Jersey. Anyway, um, these Society of American Artists folks, they gathered and exhibited together from 1878 to 1887 when Ryder's paintings were often tonalist agrarian landscapes. And we're also not going to get into tonalism here, but I would encourage you to go to the Metropolitan Museum of Arts um, American section, there are some luminous and just breath catching tonalist works there. And if you're curious, you can always message me and ask me what exactly I'm talking about. Hint, hint. But in Pinkham Ryder's mature work, the sense of dream is utterly dominant, even in painting so overloaded with material substance of thick paint that as the critic Lloyd Gerdrich has written, a tiny canvas 
weighs heavy in the hand. This was the product of years spent in a trial and error process of working and reworking a single picture carried out by a painter that declared that the artist should fear to become the slave of detail. He should strive to express his thought and not the surface of it. What avails a storm cloud accurate in form and color if the storm is not therein? The storm Ryder wanted was the sort stirred up by the German composer Richard Wagner, whose sublimely romantic music deeply touched the artist as it did many of his contemporaries. Ryder, a solitary figure, was unfortunately, unfortunately a dangerously experimental technician, applying wet paint on wet paint and mixing his oils with what was probably bitumen so that his pictures did not dry properly. But they have gone on ripening until they have actually darkened and decayed, a process that has ironically destroyed many of the exquisite nuances he had sought in endless modifications. What remains, however, tends to dramatize the extraordinary reductiveness of the final image. With all detail refined away and the whole simplified to an arrangement of broad, dramatically contrasted shapes, a painting by Ryder often evokes the convoluted emotional rhythms of Rubens and Delacroix, as well as the Gothic visionary wor world of upcoming German expressionism. American sculpture during the later 19th century was nothing if not prolific, especially in public commissions. The expanding economy led to innumerable sculptural mon monuments and architectural decorations. Those, these mostly followed the academic traditions of Rome or Paris. Augustus St. Gaudens is the preeminent sculpture, sculptor of the Gilded Age. Gilded Age is about 20 years before the fin de siècle of 1900 with unprecedented rapid economic growth, expansion of industrialization and railroads, coal mining and Wall Street, expansion of public schools, especially religious-based schools, rapid growth of cities with incoming immigrants, commodity-driven commerce, and the wealthy industrialists we've all heard of, Rockefeller, Gould, Frick, Mellon, Carnegie, Morgan, Guggenheim, and Vanderbilt. And just as an aside, um, there is a Vanderbilt, I think a great nephew, his name is William K. Vanderbilt. He's the great nephew of Cornelius Vanderbilt, which is the big Vanderbilt. Um, he has a house that is just across the bay from where I live. I live in Northport, New York. And if you're curious um, to see, <laughs> he, he lives uh, on a hill that overlooks the Sound and Connecticut, and the house is open, and you can see what generational wealth, what kind of beauty, and what kind of opportunity it builds, and how it's preserved for you know hundreds of years. So this is um, you could actually see a little bit of where I live, right about there. Anyway, back to the article. Augustus saint Gaudens received academic training in New York, Paris, and Rome, though contrary to most 19th century academic sculptors, European or American, he took fresh inspiration from sculptures of the Renaissance, notably those of Donatello. By infusing the classical tradition with his own brand of naturalism, saint Gaudens produced a number of compelling portraits and could enliven the most banal of commemorative or allegorical monuments. But Augustus St. Gaudens is renowned for his most quietly haunting sculpture, known by names such as Grief, the Mystery of the Hereafter, and the Peace of God that Passeth Understanding, or simply the Adams Memorial, a work made by the request of the author and great-grandson of President John Adams, Henry Adams, to create a more memorial to his late wife, Clover Adams. Only 42 years old, she suffered terribly from depression, and she committed suicide by ingesting potassium cyanide, which was a solution that she herself used in developing her own photography. 
The sculpture's inspired solution, stimulated by Adam's interest in Buddhism, was an austere, androgynous, graceful, powerful, mysteriously draped figure that seems to personify a state of spiritual withdrawal from the physical world. With eyes downcast and face shrouded in shadow, the sculpture consists an constitutes an unforgettable image of eternal repose or stasis. Saint Gaudens' figure bears kinship, not only with artworks created during the Renaissance in Italy, but with Northern works as well. The pyramidal composition of the figure and her inward turning contemplative quality call to mind Albrecht Dürer's famous engraving Melancholia I. Dürer's dejected figure responds to the futility of the pursuit of knowledge in the face of time and mortality. By conjuring this sentiment, Saint Gaudens invites comparison between the positive, positivism of the 19th century and the humanism of the Renaissance. Both periods look to learning as the means of bettering society and of finding personal fulfillment. Dürer's personification of melancholy warns that such intellectual pursuits remain meaningless in the face of death. No amount of empirical study can change this fundamental condition of human existence. Saint Gaudens was not the only artist to evoke this sentiment. Like many modern artists, he captures the tension between the period's interest in empirical, scientific, technological accounts of human experience and its similarly intense attraction to transcendent spiritual explanations for events or daily struggles. In the wake of realism and impressionism, artists increasingly abandoned the empirical model. Instead of seeking truth through close observation of the natural world, artists began to seek the truth in their own minds and in their own consciences. <laughs> 